This morning, we're going to turn our attention to an extremely important topic. And as you read the, um, the slide here and, and the, the, the title of the sermon today, you could leave thinking, well, yeah, great. We do need to talk about how do we respond to sin because, man, I hate it when people sin against me. And that would certainly be a good sermon. How do we respond when people sin against us? And But we'll save that for another day. Today, we're going to look more at how do we respond to personal sin? How do we respond? What is a godly response to our own sin? And... Uh, as we look at, at this particular psalm, Psalm 51 this morning, um, we see so much in this passage of Scripture that we can learn for from. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 51. We're going to read through it in its entirety, and then we're going we're gonna to spend some time talking about what it, what it is that it teaches. Beginning at verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will... Teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then I will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Let's pray. Father, Father, as we study your text this morning, as we look at this idea of how, how, what is a godly response to sin, personal sin, our own sin, Father, we pray that you make us uncomfortable. Don't let us be comfortable in our own sin, Father. I I pray this morning that you would open our eyes to what our own sin is, and, and, and we all have it, Lord. Speak to us, Father, that that though we have sinned, there is a way, you have made a way that we can be reconciled to yourself. And make this clear and plain to us, Father, that we would turn to you, that we would receive your forgiveness. Father, we pray this, that your name would be honored and glorified, not only in here, but as we leave today, as we go out into the world, that that we would be witnesses for your name's sake. And we can only do this if we respond to our own sin. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. How do we respond 
to sin. How do we respond to sin? What does a godly response to our own sin look like? Let's talk about sin this morning. I want each of you to just turn your head and look at the person next to you. Turn your head. Give them a good look. That's a sinner. That's a sinner, right? Okay, now close your eyes and picture yourself looking in a mirror because that is a sinner. That's a sinner. We need to understand that I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. Everyone we ever encounter is a sinner. We all have sin. I I want you to know that this half of the room is no better off sin-wise than this half of the room. I I want you to know that this section up here is no better off than that section out there. We all have sin. We are in equal standing in sin. I am as much a sinner as you are. And sin is a very, very serious thing. In Romans chapter 3 verse 10, we find this. There is no one righteous. No one. Not Even one. So that includes you and me. None righteous. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All. That means we fit in that category. Psalm 51 verse 5 tells us we are born in sin. Conceived in sin. We are sinful beings. There is absolutely no way around that. If we could chart, and I know this isn't a good thing to do, but if we could chart people from, you know, bottom of the barrel to the most righteous, you know, maybe, maybe Stalin, maybe, maybe Hitler, right? I don't know, like, Mother Teresa, if you would put her up there, okay? And just saying, by worldly standards, right? That's what we would do, by worldly standards. And God says, this one up here is not righteous, sinner, and everyone in between, sinner, guilty, We are all sinners. We are all sinners. None of us even comes close to the standard by which God himself judges. No one even comes close. Not even the same universe. His standard is perfection. We are sinners. Let's look at what God's word tells us about this area. What does sin do in our lives? Let me, let me just throw this out there for you. You tell me, how does sin affect our lives? What, what is the consequences of sin? Okay, it destroys your character. What else? Separation from God? Okay. Sufferings? Death? Absolutely does. Hardens your heart. Sorry? Okay. 
we're in opposition to God. We're enemies of God as a result of our sin. Absolutely. Let's look at a few passages. Psalm 32. Psalm 32, beginning uh, verse 3, says this. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. My body wasted away. It sounds to me like sin can bring health problems, health issues. Psalm 38, verse 18. I am full of anxiety because of my sin. Proverbs 14, verse 34. But sin is a disgrace to any people. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin, death. So, and, and we could, we could go on and on and on looking at passages and what they have to, to, to say to us about the effects, the consequences of sin in, in our lives. But let's, let's just kind of summarize some of the things that I see. Sin humiliates us. It brings us anxiety. It disgraces us. It separates us from God, absolutely. Sin is offensive to God. We're enemies of God. But it also separates us from those we love. Sin can hurt our human relationships as well. It can hurt those around us. We become slaves to sin, the Bible tells us. And it can cause us health problems. Um, About 10 years ago, 12 years ago, my dad was diagnosed with colon cancer. And of course, me being an internet guru, I get on the internet because I want to find out everything I can about colon cancer, so at least I understand what he's going through. And you know, I found a really interesting article. Um, According to the American Medical Association, colon cancer has been officially labeled by the AMA as a psychological disorder. Sounds weird, doesn't it? Colon cancer. Do you know why? The number one contributing factor to colon cancer is stress. Stress. Sin brings stress. And we all know that stress can bring great health problems to our lives. Sin can destroy our relationships with God and others. It gives anxiety, disgrace, health problems if not dealing with. Ultimately, sin brings death. And not just physical death, spiritual death, eternal death. But praise be to God that he has provided a solution to sin. That was not loud enough. Amen. Praise God. He has provided a solution. Absolutely. When I was a, a young a young lad, I was about 10 years old, and uh, my brother and I decided that we were going to take a journey. And so we ran away from home. Now, I was okay because I was with my brother, and he was 12, so he was really smart. And... Uh, we, we got a ways from home and, and, you know, one of the things that I experienced in that, there was no particular reason for us running away or any, we just wanted an adventure. And one of the things I experienced was the further I got from home, the further I got from my father and my mother, the more it set in, what I'm doing here is really wrong. The further I got, the more distance I placed, the more I became aware, I'm not doing right here. And that's how it is for us, I think. The further we get from God, 
the more time we allow our sin to go unconfessed, it does one of two things. It either eats away at us until we respond to God, or the other, the only other response really is our heart continues to grow harder and harder and more rebellious and more cold to God Himself, leading to deeper sin and grosser sin. Once we realize that we're in sin, once we realize that we're not in compliance with our, the will of God, like David here in Psalm 51, we need to take action to come back in line with our Father. And this action we call repentance. And you know, we don't just want to throw out Christian words and kind of expect that we're all on the same page. We, we need to understand what this word is. And Psalm 51 really gives us just a great explanation, a, a great visual, if you will, of what repentance looks like. Repentance includes five ingredients that I see. So let's, let's break each down. The first ingredient, I would say, is that of conviction. Conviction. We need to be convicted of our sin. Apart from conviction, we will never repent. The Holy Spirit he speaks to us when we are in sin. And what we need to see is that, that conviction of sin is not a bad thing. Our, our, our world certainly thinks it's a bad thing. We should never, ever speak of anyone's sin. Our, our world sells us on the idea that it's terrible. We should never bring up anyone's sin. But listen, here's the thing. Without conviction of sin, no one will ever come to Christ. No one will ever come to Christ. This is where the work of the Holy Spirit begins in a person's life. John chapter 16, verse 8, Jesus tells his disciples and ultimately us that the Holy Spirit will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. In the life of a non-believer, this is the only work the Holy Spirit does. It's the only work. Conviction of sin. The need for righteousness, the lack of righteousness in our lives producing that need, and the coming judgment because of that lack of righteousness. We need to be convicted of sin, and this conviction is the work of the Spirit of God. Now, this conviction can come in a number of different ways. It can come through other Christians around us, the body of Christ. I mean, realistically, I don't want to be left alone in my sin. I don't, I would much rather you come to me and say, brother, I see sin in your life. I would much rather hear that from you than I would from my father. And so, you know, one of the things we talked about yesterday at our at our leadership uh, uh, time together, you know, we, we were talking about this idea that, man, we need to live in community where we actually know what's going on in each other's lives because how will you ever call me on sin in my life if all you see is one hour on Sunday morning? It's not going to happen. Man, I can fool you here. But as you're in my life, and we need that, we need that. We need brothers and sisters standing in the gap, you know, loving us and saying, brother, please, you got an area you need to repent. That's a good thing. Another way that the Spirit can uh, can bring this conviction is, is obviously by reading the Word of God. I mean, how many times have I personally been in the Word of God and I'm, I'm reading and bam... Man, that's me. Man, I need to repent. I'm not right with God in this area in my life. God totally uses his word 
to speak directly to us about areas of our own lives. It can also, this, this conviction can also come from, from us just observing others around us. Be they godly people, righteous people, people of faith who are trusting Christ and living a life of faith, or, or be they sinners. You know, I can look at, at, at a godly man and say, man, you know what? There's some things there that, man, I need to make some changes. I, I'm, I should be doing that and I'm not. I should be treating my wife like that and, man, you know what? I'm not. But, you know, the same is true with the sinner. I can look at the sinner and go, man, you know what? I do the same thing. Oh, man. I, I need to repent. So God can use other people around us. I would say particularly true of Christians. But just just observing people around us can bring us conviction. God can also use our conscience. I mean, frankly, we really, generally speaking, we don't even need somebody to tell us when we're in sin. We know it. Our conscience just will not leave us alone. And God has given us that conscience. Romans chapter 2 verse 15 says, Since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences, bearing witness. That's a good thing. God gave us our conscience as a, as a warning system. You're, you're heading the wrong direction. I, I remember hearing a story true story uh, plane. I want to say it was 1979. It was in Spain. There was a a passenger airliner that that had taken off. And uh, I can't remember where they were flying, but they had taken off and they were flying over a mountainous region in Spain. And uh, and it was uh, it was a really uh, cloudy, lots of cloud layer that day. And and as they were up flying, um, the the emergency System started going off. Pull up, pull up, pull up. You're, you're too low. Increase altitude. And uh, the the pilot and the co-pilot of the plane they they were they were Spanish, Spaniards, and 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 they didn't speak English. And so they reached up and they turned off the emergency warning system. And a few moments later, they slammed into the side of a mountain. Pull up, pull up. That that's our conscience, isn't it? God has, has placed our conscience within us as a, as a warning system. You're not heading in a direction that's good. There's danger ahead. What is the danger? The wrath of God is ahead. You're not living, pleasing to God in this area. Pull up. Alter course. Change direction. And you know what? Every single one of us have it. We, we have this conscience. We have this warning system built into our very being. God has written His law on our hearts. We know when we're not right with Him. And that conscience testifies against us. We know when we're in sin. Verses 1 and 2 here in, in, our, in our psalm, we see illustrations of, of this conviction in, in David's words like, my transgressions, my iniquity. He has been convicted of sin. Listen to the opening remarks of this psalm. A psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. The Holy Spirit, working through Nathan, the prophet of God, convicted David of his sin. So let's kind of set the stage here a little bit. David is the king of Israel. He's a good king. The Word of God tells us he's a man after God's own heart. But man, even, even that man had sin. One day he's, he's out on his deck and, and he's kind of overlooking Jerusalem and he sees a woman bathing. Oh, and she's beautiful. He calls his servant, who is she? I, I need to know her name. He's informed that this is the wife of Uriah the Hittite. 
Nonetheless, he sins for the woman. He sleeps with her, impregnates her. In an effort to hide his own sin, he calls Uriah, her husband, home. Uriah was, was a man fighting for Israel. He was in the, the Israeli army. He calls Uriah home from the battle lines so that Uriah would sleep with his wife and cover up David's sin. Ah, great. It's not my kid. But his plot doesn't work. Uriah comes home and Uriah says, you know, it wouldn't be right for me, a, a, a man of the army, to come home and, and sleep in my own house and have the comforts of my home and the comforts of my wife when the rest of God's army is out on the battle line. I won't do it. Man, David can't cover up his sin that way. So what does he do? He writes a letter to the generals of his army, gives it to Uriah the Hittite to carry, and the letter says, when you receive Uriah, take him into the fiercest battle. Put him right on the front line of that battle. And when the fighting is its most ferocious, pull back all of your soldiers and let them kill him. Man, David didn't just commit adultery. Now he murdered. He murdered. This is David's sin. This is the sin that Nathan, the prophet, points out to David. And by the way, this shows us, you know what? We can just be blind to our own sin, can't we? Like, this is a pretty huge thing. And David needed somebody to come along and point it out to him. He was blind to his own sin. And you know what? We can, we can be blind to our own sin, even big sins. And Nathan was not politically correct when he came to David. You can almost hear the conversation. Listen, Dave. I know you're the king and all. I I know, man, God has clearly blessed you. God has clearly guided you. I, I love you, but listen. This thing that's going on with Bathsheba, it's not right. This is sin, brother. It's sin and you need to repent. I just can't sit by and let you continue in sin and not say anything. Brother, you need to take this before the Lord. Because because of your sin, you're in deep, deep trouble. God will not overlook your sin, even yours, David. You need to get on your face before God. You need to ask Him for His forgiveness. You need to turn from this sin. Conviction. The second ingredient in, in repentance, I would say, is confession of sin. Once convicted, once we become aware of our sin, we need to confess this sin to God. Look at verse 3 with me. I know my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. In other words, it won't leave me alone. I can't escape it. I I like the King James translation here. It says, I acknowledge my sin, my transgressions. And again in verse 4, Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. He's convicted, and that conviction leads to confession. We need to be acknowledging our sin before God. I mean, really, who who are we trying to kid anyways? He already knows. He already knows our sin. We're not hiding anything from Him. In fact, He's the one that revealed it to us. And He did it so that we would confess and turn to Him. Think think with me of the parable that Jesus told of the, the two men who prayed. There was the one man, the Pharisee. He prayed a prayer of self-righteousness. Oh, he drew right up next to the altar. And he said, God, 
hey, thanks, man, that I'm not like these sinners. I pray. I tithe. I go to church every Sunday. The other man, he stayed at a far, kept his distance. He wouldn't even look to heaven. He beat his chest. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I don't even deserve to look to you. I don't even deserve to be in this place. I need your mercy. Confession and acknowledgement of sin. We also need in our confession a genuine sorrow in our confession. Not only do we confess, but we need to do so with deep regret for the sin we have committed. Verse 17, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. It's a sorrow for wronging God. It's a sorrow for sinning against Him, His holy nature, character. Two little boys were playing together one afternoon. They'd not been playing long when when the larger boy roughed up his weaker playmate. George, the smaller boy, was too proud to complain. So he withdrew a distance and sat by himself and, and, and played, trying as best he could to hold back the tears that were ready to flow. And after a short time, the, the larger bro- boy grew tired of his solitary play and, and he called out, Say, George, come back. Come on. Uh, man, I- I'm sorry. I- I'm sorry. And George, warned by previous experience, responded to the larger boy by saying, Yeah, but what kind of sorry are you? The kind that won't do it again? You know, it's not just saying we're sorry, but really meaning it. And and, and not just we're sorry because we got caught in our sin. Not just sorry, man, man, I am really sorry that I got found out and now everybody knows. But the kind of sorry that we don't do it again. This is key. Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse 10. For godly grief produces repentance. That same passage says there's another kind of sorrow, worldly sorrow, the sorrow of getting caught, the sorrow of being found out. That sorrow leads to death. But there's a godly grief, a godly sorrow. And this godly grief produces repentance And repentance leads to salvation without regret. There are some that say repentance is not needed. Man, I'm pretty sure it is. Look at that. Repentance leads to salvation. I'm pretty sure it's needed. If we don't repent... What's going to lead us to salvation then? Godly sorrow. Sorrow for committing the sin in the first place. Sorrow for rebelling against God Himself. This type of sorrow leads to repentance and repentance leads to salvation. The third ingredient, I would say, is prayer for mercy and forgiveness. If we have wronged God, we need to pray for His mercy. Verse 4 ends with these words, So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. We, as bearers of His image, we've corrupted His image when we sin. We've corrupted His image. We deserve His justice. And He is indeed a just God. If we were wronged, we would demand justice, wouldn't we? 
Wouldn't we? I mean, just apart from Christ, I know my own life, and I know if you wrong me, I will demand justice. We better be careful what we ask for. He just might give it to us. And He is a just God and we have sinned against Him. But when we realize that that it's us in the hot seat, we plead with the Almighty God. Uh, We plead with this God who has all power. We plead with Him, please, God, please overlook my sin. Please. Please don't use your mercy, your, your power to, to give me justice. Please use your power to give me mercy instead. Look at verse 9. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Please, God, overlook my sin because I can't hide it from you and nothing I can do can ever make it go away. Only if you forgive me, God, can I find relief. Only if you have mercy on me can I be forgiven. We need to acknowledge our sins before God, realizing that we have wronged God, asking for His forgiveness and His mercy. The fourth ingredient, amendment or change in behavior. Now, we've got to be really careful What we're not saying is that Christianity is all about amending people's behavior. That That's not it. And and we're going to get to that after this when we look at our fifth ingredient. But that doesn't mean there's no change required. If, If we're to genuinely repent... Once we have been convicted of our sin, once we have confessed our sin in genuine sorrow and remorse for wronging God, whom we have admitted is in control of all things, and we've prayed for His mercy to be applied, though we in no way deserve His mercy, we deserve nothing less than His perfect justice and wrath. But now how are we to amend the situation? This is absolutely vital to repentance. Once we see the errors of our ways, we need to turn 180 degrees. We're walking this direction. We're walking in the direction of sin. God convicts us. Man, I'm I'm going the wrong way. God brings that conviction personal. I'm not only going the wrong way, I've sinned against Him. And we confess, God, I have been going the wrong direction. I've been living in sin. And we ask, God, because of what I've done, I deserve Your your justice. God, I need Your mercy. But we can't just end there and then keep walking towards sin. We have to also turn around. We've got to turn around. We've got to change direction. Repentance includes a 180 degree turning from sin. Walk the opposite direction. Walk instead of to sin, walk to God. If we've wronged someone in our lives, that means we need to confess to them. We need to ask for their forgiveness. If we've uh, been, if we're sinning in an action that, that God abhors, we need to completely walk away from that action. We need to stop doing it. And unless we do this, we are just not truly repentant. We're not truly repentant. I need to repent that because this is, this is so important. Unless we turn from sin, we are just not truly repentant. And repentance leads to salvation. True repentance includes changing our behavior and becoming obedient to God. Before we go on to the fifth ingredient that I want to talk about today, I want to, I want to just pause for a moment and I want to, I want to ask you, what, what are the struggles in your life? What are the sin areas you're struggling with? Is it, is it patience with your children? Are you struggling in your marriage? 
Is your struggle materialism? Are you struggling in the sin of lust? Maybe your sin is you've never actually confessed your need of Jesus Christ. And you've never submitted your life to Him. Maybe, maybe you think your sin is so great God could never even forgive. That's not what Scripture says. Romans 5 verse 20 tells us where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Oh, He does have the grace to forgive your sins. Whatever your sin is, and and listen, we've already determined, you and I, we are sinners. Whatever your sin is, turn it over to God. Turn it over to God. I just want to take a few moments right now in, in just quiet contemplation, and I want us to bow our heads and go before our Father, confessing, coming clean in our own lives to our Lord. Let's just take some time right now. Just just bow your heads and, and pray to the Lord. Father, we all have sin areas in our lives. And, and Lord God, we just... Father, we ask you to open our eyes to what those areas are. Father, we don't want... We don't want to continue on living in in disobedience to you. Father, convict us of our sin. Stop us dead in our tracks that we would confess to you, that we would call upon your mercy and your grace, that we would receive your mercy and your grace, and that we would turn that we would amend our lives, that we would no longer live in that disobedience, but rather we would live to your honor and your glory. We pray this for your name's sake, Father. Amen. I think, man, I think there, there's so much that we could say in, in this area of changing our behavior, but I just want to concentrate on, on one particular area that I think is, is so important for us. Listen, I didn't, I didn't ask any of you to stand up and declare your sins to the whole church. But if I did, let me just see a show of hands. How many of you would be comfortable with that? Yeah, it's not very comfortable, is it? I would quickly put my hand up if I had no sin. But because I don't. But you know what? You need to have someone in your life. I need to have someone in my life that I can confess my sins to. I need accountability. There there are steps that we can take to try to protect ourselves from repeating our behavior. And one of those means of protecting ourselves is accountability. Make sure, I can't even say this strongly enough, make absolutely sure in your life you have someone in your life you can confide in, someone you trust. Listen, the guy that just walked in here today for the first time I'm not going to share my sins with you. You haven't earned my trust. I don't know you. I don't know if you're a gossip. I I know nothing about you. But I have men in my life that have earned that trust. I trust them. I know that they would die for me. And I can tell them, listen, brother, I'm, I got some sin and I need you to hold me accountable. I need you to call me. Listen, here's what I'm struggling with. When you see it, I want you to call me on it. I want you to ask me how I'm doing in that area of my life. I I want you praying for me in that area of my life. I want you studying Scripture with me in that area of my life. 
because I'm not strong enough to stand on my own. I need accountability. I need the body of Christ. And you know what? Praise be to God that in the body of Christ we have that very thing. That's exactly what we have. We have brothers and sisters that love us. And if we're to provide meaningful help and accountability to those around us, what do we need to know? We need to know God's Word. We need to know His Word. If we don't know God's Word and someone comes to us struggling in their marriage, what kind of counsel do you think we're going to give them? Worldly advice? It's worldly advice that they're in the problem they're in. We need the Word of God. We, we need to be able to apply the Word of God to those around us, not out of judgment, but out of love. Brother, I love you. Look what the Word of God says about that area of your life. We've got to know the Word of God. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed, theonoustos, literally the breath of God and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Doesn't that sound like what we need in the family of Christ? And sometimes I need rebuking. Sometimes I just need training. I just don't know any better. Well, the Word of God provides both of those. The the Word provides teaching. Here's what your marriage should look like. And it provides correcting and rebuking. If we know God's word well, then we can apply it in our own lives and in love, not bashing it over the head of those around us, but in love, we can counsel others through God's word and offer meaningful help to the areas of sin that, that, that conviction might come, that God might lead them to repentance. Look at verse 13 with me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. And sinners will return to you. Once again, when we are walking in a direction that is right with God, then we can help others. Then we can help others. What's the most quoted passage in all of Scripture? John 3.16? No, it's not. Close. What's the most quoted passage in all of Scripture? Nope. Sorry? Absolutely. Matthew chapter 7. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Absolutely. Everybody knows that verse. And everybody's going to throw that verse around. You hear non-Christians all the time. Judge not. You're not supposed to be judging. You will hear Christians all the time use that verse. And they'll use it out of context. And they'll use it to say something it does not say. It does not say thou shall never judge. If we read it in its context, what it says is walk right in your own life. Don't judge hypocritically. Make sure you're not living in that very sin. Then you can help your brother take the speck out of his own eye. Judge yourself first. Then you can help others. Not until you're walking right in your own life can you teach others to walk right with the Lord in that same area in their own life. The fifth ingredient I'd like to talk about in in true repentance today, I'll call living faith. I don't just want to call it faith. I want to call it living faith. Verse 7, we see David's faith come just shining through here. Purge me with hyssop. Okay, that's calling on God's mercy, right? Cleanse me. But look at the faith. And I shall be clean. That's faith. Real, living faith. God, if you wash me, I am clean. Wash me, I'll be whiter than snow. That's faith. That is trusting in the power of God to deal with your sins. God, if you wash me, I am truly clean. If you forgive me, I am truly forgiven. 
Only through faith can we have this outlook. Faith that there is a God. He is in control of all things. He does love us. He wants the best for us. He always, always, always does what is perfect and good according to His will through faith. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 32. The Lord Himself speaking through his prophet, says, For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord. So turn, and the Hebrew word there is the Hebrew word that we would get the word repent from. I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies. So repent and live. Repent and live. What can we gain from repentance? Well, let me say this, let me say this about, about faith. Let me use the same illustration. We're walking in this direction in our life, the direction of sin. God stops us dead in our tracks, convicts us of our sin. We call out to Him, confess our sin, ask for His mercy, and we amend our lives. Sin and God. And we were walking this way, and, and we stop, and we turn. It's not really faith unless we walk to him, toward Him, is it? I mean, just turning and... Is that faith? Are, are we trusting in Him? We have to walk away from the sin. Um, Charles Spurgeon said it great. I, I, I love the way he put it. He said this, he said it this way. You can either turn your back to God and walk towards sin, or you can turn your back to sin and walk towards God, but you cannot do both. That's a great illustration. I have the death, I I have pleasure in the death of no one who dies, therefore repent and live. What do we gain from repentance? It's huge in our Christian walk. It's absolutely huge. Repentance is the principal message of Isaiah, Jeremiah, John the Baptist. It was the principal message of all the minor prophets. It was the first preaching of Peter, of Peter, of Paul. It was the very first preaching of Jesus. God wants us to know how important repentance is. Jesus wants us to know how important repentance is. Personal repentance to our own personal future. In fact, as I look at the points that I've laid out here for true repentance, as shown here in Psalm 51, I see the entire gospel message. The entire gospel message. Conviction. Acknowledgement of our separation from God. You'll never be saved apart from that. Confession. Taking our sin seriously, remorsefully, bringing it before the throne of God, admitting that without, without His intervention, we are in deep trouble. We deserve nothing less than His full wrath, and, and we admit that. We, we confess that. We ask for His forgiveness, His cleansing. Romans 8 verse 1, therefore, there is now no condemnation. None, zero, zilch, nada for those who are in Christ Jesus. Asking for His forgiveness, asking Him to cleanse us. What did the cross do? Cleansed us. It gave us the way that by His blood, there is no forgiveness apart from the shedding of blood. By His blood, we might be cleansed. His mercy. And number four, turning from our sinful ways and walking in accordance with God's will in our lives by faith, trusting His purpose, not our own. His plans, not our own. In faith, accepting, and this is a tough one, accepting the grace and mercy God has shown to us in forgiving us of our sins. 
you know, we're, we're not we're not the monks in the, in the Roman Catholic Church in the in the medieval times. We don't walk around punishing our own bodies for our sins. We, we don't have to make amends for our sins. In that, we man, I need to be treated badly enough that God could con, con, forgive my sins. That's not that's not us. No, we receive by faith. Jesus Christ died in my place. Jesus Christ paid the penalty in full. There is not one drop left in Jesus Christ. I am clean, free, completely reconciled with God, loved, embraced, brought right into the family of God through Jesus Christ. That that requires faith. Faith. And it's that faith that others around us see. And it witnesses the truth of the gospel that others could also turn to God and, and, and be reconciled to Him and find that same overflowing love from heaven for them as well. You know, my brother and I ran away from home and... Uh, we, we got quite a distance away from home and, and, and we realized, you know, the direction we're going is probably not the best direction to continue in. And, and we finally wised up and turned around. And you know what? Here's the thing. We knew full well we, we were going to face the wrath of my father when, when we got home. But you know what? It seemed easier to turn and willingly accept His wrath at that moment and everything that came along with that than it was to live a lifetime without Him and to continue walking in a direction that we knew was not right. And so it is in our walk with Christ. I would rather willingly carry my shame and my sin before the throne of Christ, asking Him to wash me of it now, than I would to face Him at the end of the ages with my sin in in my hands, hearing Him say, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me. There was a German girl a young girl uh, announced that she was going to have a piano concert, but she was having problems getting people excited to come to her concert. So in order to attract people, she put some advertisements together. And and one of the things that she mentioned in her advertisement was that the famous Hungarian professor, Franz Litz, was her teacher. Well, that got everybody a buzz. I mean, he's awesome. The problem was it wasn't true. And to her dismay, she learned that the professor was actually going to be visiting her town on the day before her concert. And everybody was going to find out. And Man, what would she do? So she went and she met the professor. She confessed her guilt. She asked him to forgive her. The professor answered, Listen, you made a terrible mistake. That was wrong. We all make mistakes. The only thing that you can do now is repent. And I believe that you have truly repented of your sin. Now sit down and play. At the beginning, she played with much fear and made a few mistakes. And the the professor corrected her in a few areas. And then he said to her, Now you can truly say that I have taught you. Go ahead play your concert tomorrow evening. But the last song will not be played by you. It will be played by me, your teacher. You know what? We're a lot like that girl, aren't we? We have sinned. There's nothing we can do but repent. And then we can play the role of our lives under the supervision of Christ himself. And you know what? The very last piece will not be played by us. It will be played by our Savior. It will be played by Him. 
Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. Can you imagine your Savior? Can you imagine your Savior playing that last piece? Father, he's mine. Father, I have already paid for his sins. Can you imagine hearing those words? Well done, good and faithful servant. Our Jesus gets the last piece in our lives. Acts chapter 17, 30 and 31. Therefore, although God has overlooked such times of ignorance, he now commands all people everywhere to repent. It is a command of God. He commands all people everywhere repent because he has set a day on which he is going to judge the world in righteousness. This area of repentance is just so important for our Christian lives. God has commanded us to repent. And you know what? Our timing of repentance is so critical. It's so important. We can't put this off. I wish I knew how many people in Saskatchewan died yesterday. It happened. Many people in our province died yesterday. And you know what? Today is too late for them to repent. You and I have not been promised a tomorrow. Not here on this earth. Tomorrow might be too late. Our lives can be taken away from us very suddenly. Let's not put this off. Let's repent today. Today, let's get right with the Lord. Let's close in prayer, and I'll ask the musicians if you would come back. Father, thank you so much for this afternoon. Father, we pray that your word has had impact on all of our hearts. Father, if there are any here today that don't know you, Father, I pray that you would impress it upon their heart how important it is to get right with you. And there is but one way. Your son Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Father, through Jesus Christ, we can repent of our sins and receive the forgiveness and grace of God Almighty. Wash us and we will be clean. Father, I pray this would be a reality in each and every one of our lives. To your glory and honor, we pray this in Jesus' name.